Happy to be in the Lord's house and uh, to have the Word of God uh, available to us. Have you ever seen those uh, uh, Strongest Man contests on ESPN? Hands up if you've uh, seen that. You got to be kind of careful watching that. If they lift the wrong thing with those crazy outfits on, it's like a thong fest immediately. <laughs> but um, I'll tell you what, um, it is pretty amazing when they're lifting those big granite balls up or where they're pulling a tractor trailer or, or where they're heaving these massive weights over their head. And uh, it's the picture that came to mind when I uh, kind of was studying and preparing uh, how to be strong in the Lord part two. You know, there's a strength, right? There's a strength that makes those guys look like weaklings. There's a strength that God gives. And um, if you'd open your Bibles to Acts 16, if you have a Bible, if not, there's one in the chair in front of you and you're sitting all around people that would love to share with you. And in Acts chapter 16, uh, we are told that, we see that the church is very strong. Ultimately, we're told that they're very strong. And last time I shared two things that I just want to review uh, quickly. If you want to be strong, if you, if you see that other people have a strength and you think to yourself, man, I'd love to have that, that kind of a strength. Well, people that have the strength of the Lord are doing something that you might not be doing. There's some things we do that build our strength in the Lord, and there's some things we do that drain our strength in the Lord. And if you want to be stronger in the face of temptation, if you want to be stronger uh, under the weight of trials, if you want to be stronger uh, uh, in your testimony, in your witness for Christ, if you want to be stronger in your ministry, stronger in your steadfastness in the things that you believe deeply in your heart, um, we're on it. Now, here's the first one from Acts 16. Strengthened by a willing surrender of my rights. We studied last time the uh, somewhat uncomfortable decision of Paul to circumcise Timothy, which, you know, if I wasn't a Christian, I'd run for the door as soon as I heard that. But you begin to understand it was a religious ritual that self-righteous people were trying to require of the people that Paul was reaching in Asia Minor. And even though Acts chapter 15 was the Jerusalem council where they decided, you don't have to do this. Even though you don't have to do this, it's so incredible that in Acts 16, 4, it says, well, verse 3, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. In other words, they knew that he didn't partake in their historic ritual even so, though, notice in verse 4, as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders. In other words, this isn't a thing anymore. Yeah, well, what about him? Oh, well, he was us. Oh, okay, well, I guess there's nothing to argue about there then. So, so now what? Now what? And this idea of I don't have to, no one can force me to, God's not requiring of it of me, but for the sake of ministering to others, to have a, a stronger ministry, I'm going to give up my rights. And we talked about uh, giving up your right to be heard and uh, giving up your uh, right to justice and to get justice for yourself. And probably most difficult, we talked about giving up your right to self-determine. It's shocking to me how many Christians still live their lives as though they're the chairman of the board. Now we're moving to Rockford. Well, is that ever a good decision? But, <laughs> but, but, but you didn't really pray about that. You didn't necessarily check with anyone. What church are you going to go to there? What kind of ministry are you going to have? And, and we shouldn't be living the way we are. And when we assert our rights, we lose strength. And when we surrender our rights, we'll see it there in verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith. And they increased in numbers daily. Man, a body of believers that are giving up their rights to one another and to lost people for the sake of the Lord. What a force. What a force we can be for God. Then this. I kind of hurried over this. I spent almost the whole message last week on the first point. So I'm going to go a little faster here because i got so much great stuff to get to. Somebody say Hurry. And they went through the region of Pergia and Galatia, which if I was a tour guide, I would spend a lot of time showing you maps. Maybe they can throw one up behind me, but I'm going to keep rolling here. These are places in Asia Minor. 
having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So these are all places in Western Asia Minor, and in a minute he's going to get a call over to that place. See it there, Macedonia, which is uh, really modern-day Greece. But i got to pause for a second here. Notice in verse 6, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit, then in verse 7, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. They're trying to, where should we go? And the Holy Spirit's directing them. I'm going to throw this up quickly. Here's a little chart on uh, how to make decisions. Uh, this has to do with this whole matter of um, um, how do we discern the voice of the Lord. And uh, that looks like that's too small to read. Hands up if you can't read that. Okay, great. So I can really pretty much say anything I want here. Um, <laughs> So uh, basically, you see down the one side there, methods, and uh, how common is it? So most, the most common method is, is God's Word. God directs me through His Word. And when that happens, you don't need to test it. You don't need to pray about it. You don't need to check with anybody. Just do what it says. Sometimes it's someone bringing me God's Word, and in that regard, that doesn't happen uh, nearly as often. And, and, uh, but when someone brings me God's Word, I should humbly listen and respond and pray it through and much less common is uh, someone just comes and says, I sense the Lord wants me to tell you this, and that does happen, and we do get led by the Lord, but that's not as common. When someone tells you, I think the Lord wants me to say this to you, you should pray about that very carefully and even get some counsel from others and check it with the Word. Now, directly from the Holy Spirit, I've had that happen in my life, not a hundred times, um, but I've had the Holy Spirit very clearly direct me to a person, to a conversation, to something specific. Uh, the problem isn't uh, that it doesn't happen. The problem is, is when people say that it happens, you know, every day, seven times before coffee, you know, and, and that's, um, this is untypical what's happening here, but it does happen. And so in the church today, you've got people who are anti-supernaturalists trying to say it never happens. And then you've got these sort of imaginary, every little thought that comes into my head is the Holy Spirit telling me something when the primary method for God to direct his children is through his word. I think least common of all is this um, uh, last thing which happens, um, um, you know, very, very uncommonly is, is a dream. You get a dream. But I think God does sometimes speak to us through dreams. Be very careful there. Check it with God's word. That's about to happen right here. <clears throat> Acts 16, 8. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, still in Western Asia Minor, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. It's like a dream. A man of Macedonia, I don't know, was it his accent? Was it his, what he was wearing? Um, was he standing on a map? <laughs> Somehow he knew where he was from, and he was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, next word. Immediately. Come on, lift up your voice. And when Paul had seen the vision, Immediately. so there it is. We sought to go into Macedonia, concluding God had called us to preach the gospel to them. That's the second, second thing that makes you strong. Surrendering your rights makes you strong and responding to God's call makes you strong. So if God's calling you to say something, to do something, to go somewhere, that makes you strong. And the longer you stay where you are, the longer you stubbornly refuse, the more difficult it is for God to get your feet moving, the weaker you get, the weaker you get. And I'll tell you what, though, and some of you know this, I can see you smiling and nodding already. Thank you for being so great to preach to. Here's what it is. So often... When we say, yes, Lord, yes, I will do it, there's just strength just rushes to obedience. And we say we want to be strong, but now we're observing how that strength actually comes to us. I just love their response. Well, look at the good things that happen. Verse 11. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Salmon Thrace. I feel like a tour guide here. The following day to Neapolis, by the way, uh, just a little, can I just give a little aside here? <laughs> One of the things I love about God's Word is, is that the Holy Spirit did not contradict the personalities of the authors. And so when you look at Peter, for example, Peter's very hard to preach because he's all over the place, just like he is in the Gospels. And this is Luke, all right? Luke's a doctor. What do you know about doctors? How long do they have to go to school? 
So, I mean, this guy on the detail, right? On the detail. Historians study Luke as a model of history, not a detail left out. Love that. We remained in this city some days, verse 13, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside. The reason they didn't go into the synagogue like they normally did was because this was a new mission. They had to have 10 adult men uh, to start a synagogue, and they must not have had them, so they would have prayer meetings uh, somewhere they didn't have a synagogue. So here they are outside the gate to the riverside. Kathy and I have actually been to this uh, exact place. Um, and this a particular river uh, just outside these geographic regions where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. And one of us, and one who heard us, was a woman named, say it, Lydia, Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a, a seller of purple goods. Okay, well, this, some of this stuff's just interesting to me. Just sorry if this is boring for you, but... So you know there was a time when we didn't have all synthetic colors, right? So the person who was selling purple, this is like the premium color, and actually they made purple from one vein that runs down, I think, the top or the bottom of a snail, had this purple material in it, it took, take a deep breath, 200,000 snails to make one ounce of purple dye. That's why purple was so rare. That's why purple was the color of royalty, because they were the only ones that could afford the color. And so this lady was like the regional sales manager for purple. Lydia, they're like, oh my gosh, she's at church. This is so cool. Oh, notice she was a worshiper of God. I love this. The Lord, op who opens hearts? The yeah, the Lord opened her heart. I hope the Lord's opened your heart. I hope the Lord keeps your heart open. Such a wonderful thing. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized... So that means she was professing faith in Christ and followed up by making it public and got baptized and her household, you're in, we're in. As well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Now look up here. Look at all that ministry that happened. Look at this lady get saved. Her whole family gets saved. Like, like, awesome things are happening here. Listen, why? Because God had a needy heart in a particular place, and he got a person who had the message together with a heart that he was preparing, and he put those two things together. That's when awesome things happen. And, and, and so Paul is getting strong, and Timothy is getting strong because the Lord is calling them, and they are in fact, responding. You know, I've been serving the Lord for <laughs> a while now, and I've observed that there are things that strengthen me, and there are things that drain me. And it has to do with your gifts, and it has to do with your calling. One of the worst things that happens in a church, and it doesn't happen in this church, is where people are pressured to do things that they're not gifted to do. And, and it, you just get so weak and so drained so fast. One of the things that I don't uh, love to do is I don't love uh, to do personal counseling. Can you just imagine a counseling session with me for a minute? <laughs> so, so what's the deal? Okay, okay, okay. Do this and this and this and this. I wrote it down for you. Well, I've only been here for five minutes. You can go. Okay, like, that's, that's not my thing. Now, I counsel people in my family. I, I do some counseling with some leaders in our church. It's not that I can't, but I have to sense that I'm called, and it's unusual. Because I have quite a bit of other things to focus on. Nobody wants me showing up here and saying, well, hey, sorry, no message this week, but uh, boy, I have some great counseling sessions with a few people. They're like, what, what, what? Don't you have other people who can do that? Uh, the answer is... 
Yes. Some of you who are doing that are so energized by it. And God's called you to do that and to sit and listen for 45 minutes and a person tells their story and you're so gifted to get every detail and begin to sew it all together and help them see what they can't see. Love people like that. Thank God for people like that if that's your call. Now, if you're lacking strength, could it be that you've been doing things you're not called to do? Or if you're gaining strength, maybe you've been leaning in obediently. That's so good to hear. Or if you're struggling entirely with strength, maybe you're not in the game at all, not on the field, never really rolling up your sleeves, serving because, man, when you get in that zone of doing what you're... Kathy and I were in California this week. We spent a day with Henry Cloud, just got so much insight. And then we went out with uh, uh, Kurt Cameron and his wife, Chelsea. They're good friends of ours. And so we went out for dinner with them uh, last night. And this little sweet lady came to the table to serve us in Santa Monica, right down by the pier. And I had such a sense in my heart, who is this and what's going on with her? And gradually through the meal, first with teasing and then with kind of warmly engaging and then asking some questions. By the time we were paying for the meal, I was writing a word of testimony. And before I left the restaurant, she came up and gave us a hug. That's what I do. When you're doing the thing that you're supposed to do, it's, it's just, it's so energizing. And when you're doing things, I'm not called to that. That's not best for me. And if you're here and you're lacking strength, I just really want to challenge you to get back to your calling. Get back to the main things. In fact, I wrote it down this way. When times are tough, throw aside all non-essentials and get back to God's call on your life. Who am I? What am I gifted for? Why am I here? Do the thing you do and get energy from it and feel passion in it and be strengthened by it. Such an important life principle. Man, why are some people so strong? Look deeper, you'll see that they have surrendered some rights. They're not demanding their own way. They've been called by God to do some things and they're trying their very best to do it. Now I just love this. Verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. What? This is like the... Uh, Seen those signs, right? Palm readers and astrology. And she followed Paul and us, crying out. I just want you to imagine this. So the apostle Paul, just on a scale of one to ten, how intense was he? Right? And and he's wa he's walking along, and here comes this slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God. I don't know her voice. Do you want to try to imagine her voice? These men are servants of the Most High God. <laughs> it won't matter what her actual tone is, because notice, who proclaimed you the way of salvation, and this she kept doing for many, what does it say? Days. How annoying is that? I can do it if you want me to. These men are servants of the Most High who proclaim to you the way of salvation. These men are servants of the Most High who proclaim to you the way of salvation. I mean, if she kept doing that for 10 minutes, that would be a lot. How long is she doing it for? All right, so let's give a little grace then to Paul. Paul having become greatly annoyed. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, God bless him. Right? I mean, <laughs> whew. How many people, hands up, honesty in church, how many people would not have made it to many days? Right? 
Someone get a muzzle for that girl. <laughs> this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the... Boy, there's that spiritual power. Look at the strength here. And said to the spirit... Paul looked right past. Isn't that awesome? God, forgive us for the times that we judged the person when there was something much deeper going on. Right? He said, right, just skip the girl completely. He said, right to the evil spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very hour. Wow. These are strong here. These are strong, strong Christian leaders. Verse 19. I love this. It's so practical. Luke just won't leave a detail out. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, because remember up earlier, she brought her owners much gain by fortune telling, verse 16. They're like, dang, that's our meal ticket. When her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. So this was a very pluralistic culture. You can preach on Jesus. You can preach on whatever you want to. There's no problem. Just don't threaten our income. You want to look behind the problem? Why can't those two brothers get along? What's the issue with look behind the problem? A lot of times, follow the, follow the money. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews. Like, not from here is the point. And they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept our practice. Well, they've really polished up their speech there. I'm going to think it was a little rougher than that when they dragged them in the marketplace. But now that they're up in front of the courts, they, you know, they got their lawyers there and everything. The crowd joined in attacking them. Now, isn't that always the way? Whichever way the wind the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off. This is a sign of great frustration and some embarrassment, I would think. They tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. It was actually a, a group of rods. It's, it's like, um, in modern terminology, it's like caning with a group of sticks that have quite a flexibility in them and we'd be tied together at various intervals. And when they had inflicted, how many? So how many does it have to be before you write many instead of a number? If it was two, would it say two? If it was five, would it say five? How many think they could count to 10? In the last chapter of John, it says they caught like 20-some fish. They knew the exact number. There were so many beatings that the number, many, the, the, the detailed doctor was not able to account for the exact number. Very severe. Many blows upon them. Then they threw them into prison Kathy and I have uh, been to some of these uh, prisons over here and nothing like what we would imagine, though incarceration is always a great heartache under any circumstances. But here, that's a picture of the Philippian jail, an actual excavation of a portion of it. It's just a hole in a hillside. The bars are gone, but we've, we've stood right there in that place. But here they are in the Philippian jail. I mean, do, or did, did Paul look at some of those exact rocks, you know? I mean, that's it for sure. They know where Philippi is. They know where the jail was. They threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison. So there were various rooms there and cut into the hillside. He fastened their feet in stalks. Okay, so how's the surrendering my rights and responding to God's call looking now? It's going awesome for a while. 
Just because it's going great now doesn't mean it's gonna go great forever. And just because it's getting blessed right now doesn't mean it's gonna get blessed forever. If you're in a day of blessing right now, we're in a real day of blessing in our church right now, someone say amen. amen. And, and we've had lots of other seasons too. We've had seasons of pruning, we've had seasons of personal trials, we've, we've had it all. And this is a great season of blessing. I'm very thankful for it, but I'm not under any illusion that there won't be more seasons of refining and testing ahead. So let me say on a sunny day that just because you surrender your rights and respond to God's call and experience his strength doesn't mean that it will always go easy. And I love you enough to tell the truth. Our mission here isn't to fill chairs, it's to make disciples. And I don't want you to go in the ditch because somebody promised you something God doesn't promise. So about midnight, Paul and Silas were, stop, if you, stop. If you didn't know the rest of the verse, so they're beaten, their backs are bleeding, they would beat them all along their backside and down their legs. Now they put them in stalks, so they have to sit with this exposed, bleeding part up against the dirty stone or filthy dirt in these rat-infested mountainside holes. This is the Apostle Paul we're talking about here. This is what he's getting for his faithfulness to Jesus. I mean, I would have think the verse would say, if I didn't know what it said, I'd think that maybe it's going to say about midnight, Paul and Silas were complaining. How many people feel fairly confident you would have been at least for a time on the complaining team? Um, this is not awesome. How's it going? Um, not great. Complaining or how about doubting? You know, I really believe in the Lord and I really believe in his word, but man, I'm having a hard time reconciling that with what's happening here. How about trembling? How about the sense that the beating was just the layover to the ultimate destination? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Come on, lift up your voice and say, awesome. awesome. So they're how many hundred miles from home? They're following the Holy Spirit around Asia Minor, preaching, being obedient, spending themselves to exhaustion, like that's not enough. Now they're beaten and bleeding, falsely accused and imprisoned. Let's sing. That's strong, y'all. That's strong right there. So here's the third thing, and how, how, how important this is. Strengthened not just by a surrendering of my rights, not just by responding to God's call. Strengthened by a joyful submission to a sovereign suffering. You want to be strong? You want to be strong? Listen, listen. You want to be strong like you've never been before? You want to be strong like you haven't been for a long time? You want to be strong like the people that you see and dream of having a fraction of what they have? Get vertical when it gets hard. Just, I'm leaning into the Lord more. I I'm going after the Lord more now, not less. Last time I got in a place Last time I got down, last time I started struggling and suffering, I went and satisfied myself. I went and made a bad decision. I went and, and took matters into my own hands, and I'm not going to do that again. I want the strong thing. I want the awesome thing that other people get. I'm going to get it this time, and I'm going to pray and praise 
What do you think? What do you think they were singing? What do you think they were singing? We were talking about that. What do we think they were singing? Come on, let's sing this. I think they were singing this. Come on. Blessed be your name. Come on. When I'm in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. But wait, 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 wait. That's good. But if you're going to do it, right? I mean, you're already bleeding. It really can't get a whole lot worse than this without going to heaven. So I'm thinking you're probably not going to phone this in volume wise, right? I'm thinking if they were singing, and as we're going to see in a minute, everyone was hearing and actually was transformed by what they were hearing. They're like, nobody does this. Come on, do it like that. That's the warm up. Now this. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Now we're going to sing that part again in a second. I wish this was a song that you sang at church. It'd be a lot easier if this was a song that you sang at church. But you sing this song sitting by yourself in a hospital waiting room. You sing this song sitting at the kitchen table in the middle of the night when the whole house is sleeping. You sing this song when you've been driving in your car and you don't know how long you've been driving and you don't know where you are. So when you have to sing this song, I want you to remember that we're all singing it too. Come on. On the road marked with suffering. Sing it all. That's great. Blessed be your name when I'm found. Come on. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. All right, come on, lift it up. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. So let's see where that goes. And joyful submission to a sovereign suffering. They were getting so strong. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, no, 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 no. Suddenly is if you didn't know it was coming. But if you've actually watched this pattern all through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, uh, not suddenly for them in that moment, but when I studied this afresh, I wrote down full-hearted, continuous worship in the face of suffering always leads to an earthquake. Always. And, and look, look, and to start expecting it. When it's hardest and you get lowest and sing loudest, something earth-shaking is coming soon. All right? You're like, I want the earthquake. No, actually, probably you want the thing that the earthquake 
represents, what it means, what it shakes. Because they're about to see some things shaken that make the earthquake seem small. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Say miracle. miracle. I mean, it doesn't say they took them off. It says they were off. It's like, I'm in prison. I'm never going to get out. Huh. <laughs> off. And notice, not just the worshipers. See, when someone is joyfully submitting to a sovereign suffering, everyone around them is going to get blessed. When the jailer woke, and saw that the prison do he woke. That's already funny. How much are we paying you an hour? The jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself. As we know from Acts chapter 12, when Peter got out of prison and the prisoners there were executed because he escaped. I mean, if you let the prisoners escape, you get what they were going to get. So he must have known that Peter and Timothy were going to get executed because he was going to kill himself because he thought they were out. Well, anyway, he was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Now, that's an only in the Bible right there. I mean, you would not have to conduct a seminar in southern Illinois at Marion. Okay, okay, guys, if by chance all of the doors in the prison spring open all at once, here's what you should do. How many people would agree that you wouldn't have to instruct them on this point? Right? What do you do? Hey, 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 what do you do when the... Chains fall off and the prison doors come open. Tell me, what do you do? You run. I mean, how clear is that? And so, and so he's going to kill himself. He doesn't even go look and see if they're there. He's like, they're gone. They, well, why wouldn't they be gone? They're for sure gone. I'm going to kill myself. Paul's like, we're all here. I bet you the worship service was so awesome that when the doors went open, they're like, Dang, it's all over now. You know, come on, everybody, put those chains back on. Pull that gate shut. We're not done singing here. You know, I've been to, I've been to some church services like that, right? I just don't want it to end. And you're giving me that look like this could end soon. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'm with you. I'll keep going. No, here, no, 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 no. Come on, here it is. We're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, not a common terminology for prisoners. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? In the church that I grew up in, there was a little sign hanging right here. And the sign said that. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And every sermon should tell you that to be saved from an eternity in hell, all you need to do is turn from your sin and embrace Jesus Christ by faith for your forgiveness. Amen? Yes. Well, the answer comes here in verse 31. Acts 16, 31 should be underlined in your Bible. And they said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved and your household. Now that um, phrase has been uh, wrongly used to teach what's called household salvation, which um, if I could choose an error and make it true, I think I'd probably pick that one. I mean, if you could just declare for your, how many people would like to declare for their whole household, right? But, but that's not what it means, and I can't control what my mom does and what my brother does and what my kids do, and I can't control that. But I would just say this, don't ever doubt God's salvific intent for your loved ones. 
having saved you, knowing that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, don't think any other thought but that God in his faithfulness and in his timing pursue with all your heart, share all that you have, pray all that you can, and trust God to see your family in the household of faith. Verse 32, and they spoke the word of God of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. There's a saved man right there. Sleeping, saved, now soothing, serving, soothing their wounds and serving them. Washed their wounds and he was baptized at once. Yeah, hide it under a bushel? No. He and all of his family. So there were, they all responded to the gospel. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Isn't that awesome? I just wrote in the margin of my Bible there, strong. That is so strong. Now, if Paul and Timothy and all the rest of them, Silas, of course, if they had been complaining in prison, would this have happened? Well, this wouldn't have happened without the prayer. This wouldn't have happened without the worship. This wouldn't have happened without the submission, joyfully. 35. But when it was day, here comes the last thing. So, strengthened by a willing surrender of my rights and by a obedient response to God's call and by a submission to a suffering that he has allowed. Now this, strengthened by a true vindication in God's time. This is going to get great right here. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. Go preach in some other city. They want you to go. Look up here. If you don't know what's coming next, you're going to be shocked by what's coming next. He's like, oh my gosh, they got out of prison. Now they're going to let him go out of town. They're just going to go. They're not just going to go. Go in peace. Verse 37. Paul said to them, they've beaten us publicly. Uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? Nope. Let them come themselves and take us out. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, that's strong. The police reported these words to the magistrates. And they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. Sorry we beat you so that your back is completely shredded. Sorry. Sorry we did that. Just write in the margin of your Bible there, just write vindication. The word vindication means to clear from accusation, to declare innocent. So they came and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. We could have made a much huger deal, but it would appear as though they forgave them because there's nothing further. And they went out of the prison, visited. Oh yeah, I love this. We'll go when we're good and ready. We'll go. We'll go. S soon. On the way out of town, there's like, oh, remember Lydia, that purple lady? She goes, I liked her a lot. Yeah, I remember when she got saved. Yeah, let's go check in on her. They want us to leave. We're leaving. We're leaving. We're just going to visit our friends first. We're Roman. <laughs> and when they had seen the brothers, they had, you know, we had some other people we need to visit too. I mean, that's just sweet. That's vindication. What's really awesome about that It's one of the things that actually that Henry Cloud shared with me this week in a pretty personal moment. He said, he quoted to me Romans 8, 33. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? What an, what an awesome thought. 
What, what, a, what a beautiful, liberating truth. Don't, only God can truly vindicate you and restore your reputation. Don't let any human being have that power over you. It doesn't matter what she says. It doesn't matter what he said. It doesn't matter what they say. What matters is what God says. That's why Paul said to the Corinthians, judge nothing before the time. For the time is coming when the Lord will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Then each one's praise will come from God alone. And I love Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Now, I looked there for a while when they were sitting in prison like a weapon against them was prospering, but in the end, it didn't. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the children of the Lord, says the Lord, and their righteousness is from me. Wow. If God be for us, who can be against us? Look up here. You are who God says you are. You are who God says you are. You're not who your parents say you are. You're not who your past says you are. You're not who your problems say you are. You're who God says you are. And there's strength in that. And lean into that. And trust God for a vindication in his time. You know what's on your heart to do for God. You know what's on your heart to be for God. And if you just lay down your rights and obey God's call and submit joyfully to whatever hardship he allows and wait patiently for vindication in his time, you'd get so strong. Don't you want to be strong? 